Hello, this is Dr. Schufer. We're going to discuss canine hip dysplasia, its detection and treatment with the help of this presentation. Please sit back and enjoy the presentation. If you have any questions when we're done, either myself or Dr. Henderson will be happy to discuss them with you. In order to understand hip dysplasia, we need to understand the general hip anatomy. The hip is a compound joint made up of a ball or the femoral head fitting into a socket or the acetabulum portion of the hip. The round ball fits into a round socket and rotates freely. The head of the femur should fit nice and tight inside of the acetabulum. Here is a radiograph or x-ray of normal hips. Notice that the acetabulum is deep and the head of the femur fits snugly inside of it. This is what your, hopefully your dog's hips look like under x-ray. Here is a schematic of a dysplastic hip. Notice that the acetabulum, noted on the lower left-hand corner of the slide, is shallow and the, fe the femoral head does not fit easily into it. Over time, the femur bounces around in this joint, stretching the joint capsule and causing arthritis, which is depicted in the upper right-hand side of the picture. Here is a radiograph of dysplastic hip. Notice that the femoral heads are barely covered by the acetabulum. The acetabulum are not very deep and the heads of the femur are irregularly shaped. Large breed dogs are more prone to hip dysplasia than small breeds, but all breeds can have it. The smaller breeds, being lower in weight, tend to have less problems in terms of arthritis as they get older, but on occasion they do have just as bad a problem as the big dogs. Dysplasia is an inheritable trait, meaning that it passes from the parents down to the offspring. 60% of the development of a dysplasia is due to genetics, and 40% is due to environmental factors. Though that re relates to how fast the dog grows, how heavy they are during the growth cycle, how much calcium and phosphorus are in their food, and how much activity they get during growth. We try to limit those things to minimize growth, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the program. How do we diagnose hip dysplasia? Typically, we diagnose hip dysplasia with a combination of palpation and radiography, or x-rays. The Orthopedic Foundation for Animals, or OFA, hip extended view has been used historically to diagnose dysplasia at about 24 months of age. The view on the lower left-hand side of the screen depicts this typical view. And in this case, the dog is sedated, lays on its back, and the, the hips are extended so that we can see the hip joint very well. The other technique that's used, which we feel is more sensitive, is the pen hip radiograph, denoted on the right side of the screen. With this technique, we can diagnose hip dysplasia as early as 14 to 16 weeks of age. Frequently, patients come to us with hip dysplasia whose parents were certified by the OFA as being either good or excellent in hip quality. So what happened? Well, it turns out that the OFA is doing their certification at 24 months of age. And yet, if you go on and read radiograph those same dogs at 5 and 6 and 7 years, up to 75% of them actually have hip dysplasia. So what that means is that the technique we're using at 24 months is not predictive as to whether or not the offspring will have hip dysplasia. So we cannot trust the OFA ratings to get a, st a significantly better offspring breeding. Over the past 20 years, the University of Pennsylvania Veterinary School has developed the pen hip system of hip dysplasia detection. Their goal, just as the OFA, is to try and reduce hip dysplasia by helping breeders select the appropriate specimens to breed to, to reduce the incidence of this disease in the offspring. The premise of the pen hip system is that a dysplastic hip is a loose hip. And by using a special distraction view, we're able to determine just how far the hip can be pulled out of the joint. And the further the femur can be pulled out of the acetabulum, then clearly the looser the joint and more likely the dog will have hip dysplasia. In this view, you can see how far the femoral head is from the inside of the acetabulum. And if we were to take this same dog and take a view in the uh, OFA hip extended view, it would probably look normal. The pen hip distraction view allows us to actually get quantitative measurement as to how far or how loose the joint is. 
The PenHIP Association will measure our films and give us a value called the distractive index, or DI, which lets us know what the likelihood is that the dog either has or will have hip dysplasia. The lower the DI number, the better. So if we have a dog whose DI value is less than 0.3, that dog will probably never get hip dysplasia. If we were to look at all the racing greyhounds and the borzois, the sighthounds, most of those dogs have beautiful hips and their distractive indexes are under 0.3. Distractive index values above 0.45 are likely to develop dysplasia and the higher the value the more likely the dog is to get hip dysplasia. Certain breeds uh, have average values that are way over 0.6 which means most of the dogs are going to have dis hip dysplasia regardless of what we do. Let's discuss the pen hip technique itself. In order to perform this procedure, your dog needs to be heavily sedated or fully anesthetized. Once they're down, we take three different views. The standard hip extended view of the OFA, which helps us determine whether or not there is any active arthritis in the hip at the moment. The second view is the compression view, seen in the central bottom portion of the slide. In this case, we're actually pushing this, the, hips in, the, the femurs into the hips a bit, and it lets us see how well the fem femoral heads conform to the acetabular shape. The final view, and the most important one, is called the distractive view. This view is made with a special patented device that helps us to lever the femoral heads out of the acetabulum at a known specific amount of pressure, and then we can measure the distance that they actually travel. Once the films are taken, they are sent to the University of Pennsylvania for evaluation. The distractive index that they come up with is sent to us along with breed averages which let us tell whether or not this dog should or should not be bred. How do we prevent hip dysplasia? Well, of course, if we had all dogs that had distractive indexes below 0.3, we wouldn't even have to worry about this disease. However, if we look at our breeds and we say a certain breed has a distractive index average of, say, 0.6, if we were to, to breed only dogs with values better than that, slowly but surely that breed would improve and improve until the distractive index average was below 0.3. Many breeders are cooperating with this, but certainly many more need to in order to really make an effect on the overall breed uh, or population uh, incidence of hip dysplasia. If we sterilize pets with bad distractive indices, that will remove them from the gene pool and help us prevent spreading of this bad gene. As an owner, what you can do is to help your dogs grow slowly. All dogs fed uh, the Science Diet Large Breed Growth Formula will reduce hip dysplasia by up to 30 to 40 percent. The reason for this is that this food is calculated or formulated to reduce the growth rate and to slow the bone growth rate in particular. Dogs will end up being as big as their litter mates, but instead of reaching their peak height and weight at, say, 8 to 12 months, they'll probably hit that goal at about 14 months. We also try to limit strenuous activity for the first 12 months of life. This doesn't mean your pet can't play, but we try not to do things like climb hills, go to the beach, play tug-of-war, things that are very strenuous on the uh, hips. We can actually treat hip dysplasia in young dogs if we catch it early enough. So our goal is to screen the pets at 16, 14 to 16 weeks of age using the pen hip split system. If the distractive index is suspect, meaning that it's greater than 0.45, then we can do a surgery called the juvenile pubic symphysiodesis, or JPS surgery. During the JPS surgery, we use an electrosurgical device to stop growth in the uh, growth plate at the bottom of the pelvis, as depicted on the lower left hand side of this slide. The top of the pelvis continues to grow and as you watch the picture below you'll see that the acetabulum grows slowly over the heads of the femur. Dogs that are treated between 14 and 20 weeks of age will go on to develop what look like normal hips by 12 months of age in 85 to 90 percent of the cases. This will prevent them from becoming dysplastic and having arthritis later in life. What do we do if we miss the window of opportunity of diagnosing and treating the dysplasia before 20 weeks of age? If we find a dog who is dysplastic between 20 and 20 weeks and 12 months of age, 
another surgery can be performed that's a little more complicated and involved than the JPS surgery. It's called a triple pelvic osteotomy. In this case, the pelvis is cut in three places surrounding the acetabulum, allowing us to free up the acetabulum and rotate it over the femur. It's then mechanically placed into that position using specialized plates and screws. As in all techniques, there are pros and cons to this surgery. The pros are that it actually works quite well in the majority of cases. Most of the dogs will go on to live a relatively uh, arthritis-free lifetime. The cons are that uh, there is a certain time frame within which it can be done. We're limited to the dog who's 12 to 14 months of age, preferably before the bones have finished growing completely. And the recovery in this surgery uh, takes at least 8 weeks, sometimes as long as 12 weeks, uh, during which time the dog has to be kept in a crate. So it's a lot more aftercare than we have with JPS surgery, which basically is recovered in 2 weeks of time. Uh, there is the possibility that in some occasions, particularly if the dogs are not restricted in activity, the implants can fail. That means the screws can fall out or the plate could even break. And it's a much more expensive surgery, running approximately $3,500 per side. If we don't have the opportunity to diagnose and treat the dysplasia before the dog matures, sometimes we're left with a very arthritic hip, which can occur as early as two to three years of age, but more commonly will affect the dog in this five to seven year old range. In these cases, there are medical management that can be attempted. We can use uh, drugs such as Cosequin and Adequan, which, in, which help the uh, joint fluid improve in its viscosity and help protect the cartilage. And we have non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs that are very effective at mitigating the pain. When things get really bad, we can add morphine or morphine derivatives to that to uh, help uh, ease the animal's pain as well. In some cases, all the medical management that we try is ineffective and the dogs are just miserable, at which point we have to consider doing certain types of salvage procedures. The most common one that is performed is called the femoral head ostectomy. In this surgery, the head of the femur is re physically removed from the bone. As you look at the radiograph to the left, you'll see that there is no round ball on the end of this femur. Now, looking at it on the x-ray, you'd think, well, how is this joint going to work? Well, it turns out the body will create a false joint out of scar tissue uh, between what's left of the head of the femur and the acetabulum. Uh, in this case, there will be no bone-to-bone -bone contact, and that will essentially uh, alleviate most of the pain. Dogs tend to do quite well with this surgery. They return to function at about 80 to 90 percent of their original ability to walk. Their gaits tend to be a little bit sloppy, but by the time they're at this stage, they're usually not particularly big athletes. Um, the recovery time for this surgery is generally uh, two to four weeks of age, and it tends to be intermediate in expense. $1,800 to $2,200 would be an approximate cost. One of the best salvage procedures available to us is the replacement of the affected hip with a completely new implant or a total hip replacement. This is similar to the surgery that's performed on many adult humans, uh, particularly as we get older. Uh, total hip implants are um, very successful when they're done properly. Generally, they have to be done by a specialist, and there are some specialty centers we can send you to to have this surgery performed. The response to uh, therapy is usually quite good, although there is a potential for failure of both the implant uh, as well as infection uh, during this type of surgery. Uh, it's a very expensive surgery, uh, generally running about $4,500 per side. But if it's within your budget, this probably is the best option for a dog with chronic arthritis, and particularly for the younger dog who has a long life ahead of them. To summarize, hip dysplasia is a genetic disease of most dogs, uh, primarily large breeds, but it does affect uh, small breeds as well. There's a strong environmental component to it, uh, which can be controlled with proper feeding and exercise restriction during the growth phase. We can help eliminate uh, hip dysplasia from the breeding population by using the pen hip system and the distractive index values to determine our breeding pairs and to determine which animals to sterilize. If we diagnose and treat the disease uh, early based on the uh, distractive index values at 14 to 16 weeks 
and employing the JPS surgery, we give your dog the best prognosis for naturally functional hips throughout their life. Uh, if we miss that window of opportunity, there are medical and surgical management options that can help maintain quality of life in spite of the dysplasia. If you have any questions about hip dysplasia or the surgeries that we've discussed herein, uh, feel free to talk to myself, Dr. Schufer, or Dr. Henderson, or any of our trained staff. Thank you for your attention.